computer. Okay, we are recording. Um, okay. Okay, so live streaming to us here in New Zealand from Abingdon in Oxfordshire in the UK. Welcome, Jim Champion. You're going to speak to us tonight about the middle way. So for anybody who's watching this video on YouTube or wherever, Jim is a member of the Middle Way Society and has taken part in the international online secular Dharma community known as Recollective. Now, Jim, you've first encountered secular Buddhism, I believe, in April 2016. And for the Two Free Project, you contributed the excellent study group questions which are found in the book After Buddhism, a workbook by Winston Higgins. And you're currently writing questions for our second book, What Is This? Ancient Questions for Modern Mind. So, Jim, welcome back to Wellington. Over to you and um, tell us about the middle way. Thank you. Right, okay. Um, I have spoken to this this group before and I always overran so uh, excuse me this time um, I've scripted it a bit more so uh, I'll try and make it sound like I'm not just reading it out but uh, it is it is what I want to say so uh, good evening everyone <laughs> yes <laughs> good someone someone's there right okay um, I will I'm not going to speak for long it'll be about 10 minutes um, and then uh, Afterwards, if, if you've got any questions, please do ask, or I've, I've got a few prompts. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, this, this will be helpful um, for your meditation and beyond. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, what I'm doing is I'm suggesting that meditation needs the middle way to be more helpfully understood, um, in the sense that meditation isn't an end in its... It does have its... Uh, interdependent existence along with uh, other parts of the the Buddhist path like ethics and wisdom uh, the thing about meditation is uh, its immediacy and its directness uh, which make it the ideal place to start practicing the middle way so I'm going to give a, uh, a simple hopefully concrete example um, of how you can experience in meditation this process of navigating between two opposites hence the middle way between these two opposites so on the one side you might have uh, the thought of i can't do this and on the other um you might be thinking i can do this it's easy um no doubt you've experienced this the first time you ever meditated um i know i did and then you know on most occasions since the belief that you that you can you know, easily do whatever it is you're trying to do, and the opposite belief that you can't. They're a very familiar pair of opposed absolutes. Uh, neither of these beliefs on their own stands up to experience. I mean, you can do it, you know, you, you meet it to some extent, but this, this uh, idea of absolutes, um, you know, they just don't match up to what we actually experience. Um, both of them keep coming up, though, um, and one of the things about meditation is these things will keep coming up, but you learn to recognize them. And then uh, the middle way, you learn to navigate between them. Now, it's that, that example that I've given of either thinking that, you know, I can do this or I can't do this, it's not particularly subtle, um, but hopefully it's one that you're familiar enough with. Uh, when you experience these, these opposing beliefs in other circumstances, uh, outside of, uh, sort of the controlled time or place you've set aside for meditation, um, they might be a bit overwhelming but when you're uh, looking or when you're experiencing them in meditation you're less likely to be processing them in the abstract uh, you're, you're gonna you're gonna experience them um, more as, as a part of your wider awareness that you've you've got while you're meditating um, and in, in this way uh, sort of taking these absolutized uh, very uh, simple and unrealistic beliefs that you have and then experiencing them within a wider bodily awareness. Um, this, what I'm saying is that when you experience them in this way, um, it's, it's going to be actually more helpful to you because you live an embodied life. You live an embodied existence. So um, in whatever meditative practices you might have tried, um, other familiar pairs of opposites may, may have come up. So uh, think about them as you know, the two sides um, that you're trying to navigate between uh, it, with the middle way. Um, you may have, for example, um, you know, I should just follow the instructions on the one side, and then uh, you know, I should be more open to what I'm experiencing and just go with the flow 
on the other. Uh, and another example is um, you could be feeling very frustrated. So, you know, just thinking, well, you know, I don't have to sit here and take this. So I'm just going to get up and go. Um, on the other hand, you, you might have the, sort of the opposing belief of, you know, just, you know, relax and let it, you know, let it all go, let it all flow on the other side. Now, um, you know, the simplicity, not necessarily that I, I'm not, sorry, I'm not saying meditation is easy, but sort of the simplicity of the situation of, of meditation where you've, you've stripped it all back um, of that context. Hopefully it uh, means that you can recognize these extremes without becoming uh, possessed by them as, as such an abstract idea. Um, so this is the way uh, I think that meditation provides an opportunity to practice navigating the middle way uh, between, between extremes uh, and practicing a wider perspective on things that's going to hopefully help you practice the middle way in judgments you make outside of uh, a formal meditation type context. So, you know, as with other things, it's, it's not always going to, it's not always going to happen just because you've you know, meditated a few times that all of a sudden you're going to be able to uh, sort of steer clear of unhelpful absolute um, beliefs. But um, if you practicing meditation regularly, as, as I assume you're all doing, um, you can develop a habit um, and you're more likely to make use of it when some kind of uh, absolute belief starts to dominate um, your experience. Now, at this point, I'm just turning over. At this point, um, it's worth slotting in um, one of the uh, parables of the Buddha, partly because uh, last time I spoke, uh, it was on uh, some of the metaphors uh, that the Buddha used that are particularly appropriate to, uh, to navigating a middle way. Um, and the parable that I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about uh, for a few minutes now. Um, when I first heard it, it was, it was one of those things we thought, well, wh why is that even a story? You know, that, that seems so obvious that sure, surely anyone who's ever meditated um, for, for even like 10 seconds is, is going <laughs> to appreciate this. You know, wh why is it worthy of, um, you know, of, of actually being used as a, a, a teaching example? Um, so I thought it was a bit obvious. Um, I think, though, that partly I've missed the point. As, as always, there's usually a sort of a greater depth to these things um, and also you can uh, the kind of metaphor you can extend it you can take it further um, and it's, it's helpful in other ways as well other than sort of the straightforward way that it's usually presented so um, this the particular st story I'm talking about here um, it's it involves a discussion between uh, the Buddha so Gotama and um, a solitary monk called Sona I, I think that's how you pronounce it uh, and basically this, this monk was having uh, troubles. I mean, may, maybe you don't identify with, with monks. I can't say that I particularly do. Um, but, um, you know, we all have things. And in, in this particular case, this monk was on the verge of giving up what he was doing. He was living a solitary life. He was, he was meditating. He was, he was following that kind of lifestyle. And um, he really did feel like giving up because he, uh, he didn't feel he was getting anywhere. He was putting in loads and loads of effort, loads of hard work. Um, and didn't feel he was getting anywhere. And so uh, I, I will provide a sort of a, a quick paraphrase of the, uh, of the exchange between the two of them. So uh, the Buddha says, uh, I've heard you're not getting results from your effort, Sona, and you're thinking of packing it in. Suppose I could give you some encouragement. Would you give it another chance? And Sona says, uh, yeah, of course I would, if, if you, can, you can do that. Right, so the Buddha said, uh, so, uh, you know, previously, before you were a monk, you used to be a musician and you played the lute with great skill. So I've heard. Sona said, yeah, that's right. So the Buddha says, uh, so was it possible for you to play good music when the strings on your lute, so, you know, stringed instrument like a guitar, um, when the strings on your lute were well tuned, not, not too tight, but not too slack? And Sona replied, yeah, of, of course, I, I was able to play great music when my lute was tuned just right what happened when the strings were too tight said the buddha sona replied i couldn't play decent music obviously and the buddha said and what about when the the strings were too slack and sona says well of course my my lute uh you know it wasn't very easy to play at all when the the strings were too slack so at this point you know the, this brief exchange ends um you know the simplistic takeaway 
that the, it's, it's usually given here that the, the Buddha is basically pointing out you know, if you make too much effort, things aren't going to go well. If you, if you don't make enough effort uh, in, in whatever form, it, you know, things aren't going to go well. You know, no, no wonder if you're not achieving some kind of balance between those two, um, that you're going to be dissatisfied with, with the way things are. Um, just stopping there, though, and, and looking at it as a point of saying, well, basically, you know, you've, you've got to um, give things the right amount of effort, not too much, not too little. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't sound like a particularly profound point, but I think you, you can go deeper um, and it, it does apply a bit more um, to sort of or a deeper understanding of what we mean by practicing the middle way than just the idea of getting some kind of balance between, you know, uh, extremes one way or the other. Uh, so uh, to stick with the, the loot example, um, there's more to, to loot playing than just getting the, the right string tension alone. Um, it's obviously worth getting that right to start with, um, even if you have a beginner. Um, I'm actually sat in my son's room. He's got a ukulele somewhere. That's something that's a bit like a loop. Um, even a beginner really needs to have a, you know, an instrument where the strings have been tuned as best they can. You know, because it's it's going to sound awful no matter, no matter what, but whether you know you're a highly accomplished lute player or, or, or a novice. Um, a more adept lute player though is going to know good uh, is going to know that it's it's no good just tuning your instrument once. Um, it's not that you tune it once and then forevermore, uh, you know, your lute playing is going to sound amazing. You do have to keep retuning it. So you know. Things happen. The strings stretch as they get older. Maybe the temperature changes, or you knock it. Um, uh, sort of another example of of why uh, you might need to retune is you might want to play along with others. So you might find that your your lute sounds good on its own, but then you go to play with other people, uh, you know, and they're all tuned slightly differently. So you, you have to go through a retuning process, you know, frequently in order to make sure that your you know your music remains beautiful. So. What I'm suggesting is that uh, if we take this analogy, um, the middle way does consist of uh, making judgments, because that's what it's about, um, between these sort of opposing beliefs. And you are constantly remaking these judgments, trying to hit a, a middle point between sort of affirming and denying these fixed uh, absolute beliefs. The idea being that if you if you do that, you're going to uh, you know achieve a more satisfactory or helpful outcome than if you avoid it so in this way uh, the middle way is a process that's you know process underlined and involved it's a process of judgment not a fixed belief in itself so quite often you, you hear you know the middle way talked about maybe with sort of capitals uh, used for it sort of the idea that it is it is a belief in itself you know the middle way um, what i'm talking about here is the middle way as a process and uh, we can think about it as a process of when it comes to making judgments, um, making sure that we're always tuned in to what the conditions are like at that time. So it, it does require um, an attitude of holding beliefs provisionally. So that means sort of you know holding them for they're good they're good for now they're the best you know that I can do with for now, um, but also being aware of how the conditions um, that you're you're living in are changing. Um, so you know when some kind of reorientation or adjustment is due. All right. So to bring it back again, specifically to meditation, um, when when you're meditating, it's it's an excellent context for um, for directly experiencing the fact that you need a middle way approach to beliefs. Um, I mean, in short, if if you don't have that, if you don't have a middle way approach, you're you know you're pretty much very soon going to get fed up. Um, with meditation and quit one way or another. Um, so that's what I mean about it's a very direct uh, way of experiencing this. Um, if, if you, so if you do approach meditation with uh, one kind of rigid belief, right? For example, it's um, it's you know it's just going to be too demanding. It's it's going to be too stressful, um, you know, to sit in silence for a certain amount of time. Um, then you know you're not going to get any satisfaction from that any more than uh, sort of this badly tuned lute is going to produce tolerable music. Um, coming at it from the other angle, and, and if you have a, a, sort of a fixed belief um, that meditation is, it's not, not hard work, it's the opposite of that. It's, uh, it's just about, you know, you've got to completely relax and just uh, tune out to whatever's going on and you know, empty your mind. Um, 
it's similarly that that's not sustainable uh, it's, it's not going to you know it's not going to be something that you're going to keep on on or keep at a practice you're going to keep with um because it's, it's not sustainable in that kind of way however if we think about uh hitting on the the right tuning for your loop um you, you hopefully if you manage to navigate between those two ideas of uh not being too rigid not being too relaxed um that you're gonna you know have a, a an outcome that you'll be able to keep going for now um but again it's a temporary thing you'll be able to keep going for the time being for, for a short while whatever uh, you know music you're you're making might be beautiful um but it, it's likely that you're going to get stuck in some way um i mean w whenever i've got stuck it's, it's because I'm, I'm hanging on to some belief or another however long it took me to realize that um and so sticking with one rigid belief or another um rather than finding a balance is is a you know it's one way of describing what happens when when you get stuck with your meditation practice um being being able to loosen up your that belief i mean it's it's it sounds simple but it, you know it really is in practice so that, that probably is the sort of the, the sort of the catch here it's it's an easy thing maybe to state that you know oh yeah you've just got to recognize that you're out of tune and, and you know retune your loot um but it's it's not something necessarily easy to do and it it does require practice um which is why i'm encouraging you to keep up with the meditation um when when you do loosen up that belief whatever it is that's that's you know enabling or holding you up that's, that's keeping you stuck um you know you're being a little bit more provisional you're you're not thinking that whatever it, idea it is that's possessing you and, and keeping you stuck um is, is the whole truth um and you're able to build habits that are basically more adequate to the the embodied experience that you're living in this um this experience where um you know absolute abstract ideas are, are not what we're actually dealing with in, in living our lives um ethically day to day uh, so i feel like i've i've said quite a bit but just to summarize um probably this this um sorry to summarize the, the idea that I'm presenting is um, to look at um, meditation as a way of recognizing the need for taking a middle way, and then to appreciate that um, when I say a middle way, what I mean is not some kind of compromise between um, two sort of opposing beliefs, but more a process of constant adjustment to whatever these uh, beliefs are that, that may be uh, getting you stuck in the context of meditation. I'm also suggesting that um, this is, you know, this is a useful thing, a useful way of looking at it because it is something that can um, extend beyond uh, your meditation practice. It's something that will will help you making uh, other other judgments um, that, you, that you you know need to make as a as a person living you know living your life day to day, um, and that by practicing in meditation you are more likely to to um, uh, transfer these things. Um, to your your, dis, your judgments that you have to make from day to day. That's it from you, is it, Jim? Yes, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll, sorry, I can sign off. I'm just going to turn the volume up a bit so I can hear. Now, if anybody has any questions, approach the computer and Jim can see you and put your all comments. Doesn't have to be a question. Well, Jim, you look like you stunned us completely. <laughs> well, so I know, I know. It's, it's, sorry, it's one of those things that I'm, I'm so familiar with the, the sort of the ideas that I'm talking about. But yeah, I appreciate if you're throwing out. I mean, for example, uh, if if you you know want something to get started with. Um, when, when we're talking about navigating a middle way, I, I mean, I gave an example of, um, you know, it, it could be something uh, fairly major, like, you know, I, I know what I'm doing, I, I can do this, or I've got no idea what I'm doing, you know, I, I should just quit. Um, they're two um, fairly major opposing ideas that you, you're going to, you could get hung up or stuck on. Are, are there any other things, you know, however trivial that, um, uh, that, that you know you have have got hung up on or stuck on 
and maybe with hindsight you, you can now recognize that they, you know you were kind of trapped by a, a very simple abstract you know one-sided belief or another I've got one, it's a little bit quick. I've got one, Jim. Um, it's about eating. Oh, I think it's, oh, this one. This oh, yeah. is, sorry, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Because you sort of, you come up and kneel before the computer. But, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm sitting on the floor as well. So I'm down with you. Okay. I can uh, see you in here. Good. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I um, had this like, a bit of a view that you had to have like, when, when you eat, you have to have like the same quantity every night or every morning. Um, and or this amount of protein, this amount of carbohydrates, but I've sort of been changing it like um, in that if I feel a bit hungry, I'll eat a bit more, and if I don't feel hungry, I'll eat a bit less. So I'm sort of, um, I guess, being mindful of the current situation and making that adjustment um, as such. So like I, I play squash, and then maybe the next day I'm a bit more, more ravenous, so I'll eat a bit more. Um, but during yeah. the week, might might not be so hungry so um but i think previously i would um just eat the same amount doesn't matter what i'd be doing yeah um yeah, I know you mean. I think that's, even though it's not a very um deep example it's, it's no no but that's the thing i mean very 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 few of these these examples are um i mean i know i know what you mean for, uh, like for example um the, the thing is about you know the, and the something that i used to get stuck on was how is it that you make the sleep? Because you can obviously be stuck in doing a particular thing, like you get into a habit or maybe, maybe someone that you really respect or, or trust has you know, told you a particular thing is the case and you've taken it on board. And in, in this case, you know, like eating a, a, you know, a very specific amount or a specific mix of, of different things. Um, and you kind of, it, it might not be doing you any harm, which in which case, you know, carry on going. But if, if you find that for, for one reason or another, it's, um, you know, it's, it's sort of creating a sticking point. Um, you know, what is it that actually, you know, opens you up, pushes you, you know, gets you to recognise that there can be other routes? Um, I mean, can you can you remember any anything in particular that sort of caught, you know, helps to nudge you away from this sort of very repetitive uh, sort of eating the same amount all the time to being a bit more flexible with it? I mean, was there anything in particular that nudged you over the edge? Uh... I don't know if there's anything triggered me. Um, maybe like, uh, you yeah, maybe just being mindful of, of what the body's saying. So just like, uh, yeah. rather than intellectually saying, okay, this is a certain amount of things I've got to do. I I'm letting my uh, body say, this is what I should do. Like, okay, if I'm hungry, I'll eat. If I'm not hungry, yeah. I'll eat. Rather than, okay, I'm going to eat like one portion of protein, two portions of carbohydrates, every four yeah. hours or something. Like, right? Like I you know that's sort of that sort of very regimented personality, um, but I think uh, if I recognise, oh yeah, uh, I'm a bit I'm a bit hungry today. I think I'll eat a bit more, and, and there's a reason for it because I had I played a bit of sport yesterday or I missed yeah. a little or whatever, and it, it makes sense. And you know, yeah, to me, and even with um, say if you're working with people or in a different project, sometimes you've got to wear a different hat. Like you've got to <laughs> be a bit more stricter with this person, or be a bit more relaxed. So that's you've got to appreciate the moment and and adjust your strategy for that. So I think yeah, I, actually, I, what what you said make, yeah makes a lot of sense to me. When um, one of the things I noticed when um, sort of four years ago or so when, when I started meditating uh, was about sleep. So if if you'd ask. He's frozen. He's frozen. <laughs> Whoops, he'll come back. Is it just the internet, is it? Yeah. Maybe not so, he'll come back. Um, was the fact that I probably wasn't getting enough sleep. Um, and you know, it's in, in the meditation, mm. I would often be doing this in, in the evening, sort of maybe, maybe sort of nine o'clock or so in the evening. Um, I would I would notice how on you know maybe on work days how I, I would be literally falling asleep at nine o'clock and and I was believing that you know no I was fine and I, I didn't know to you know I still had another few few more hours before I ought to go to sleep so 
even in a sort of in it like you say listening to your body a bit more and you know even though my head was telling me no you're fine you know you can get, go to sleep at 11 everything's great well you know from what might be i don't know you, you always feel like oh I'm, you know i'm not doing this properly if you keep falling asleep but um it was it did at least you know help me change things positively one way and actually recognize that you know some days i was more tired than others and that perhaps ought to re, you know think rethink how am i actually going about this it's, it's something that i hadn't considered for years and I'd, i you know i'd be going on that way for maybe 10 years without realizing it probably not getting enough sleep certainly weekdays um and it, it was that process of in that case i did something different and which was starting to meditate it didn't happen in the mornings it was it was only when i did it in the evenings but meditating in the evenings apart from um adjusting other habits like stopping me from working on into the evening it, it also meant that i could recognize this sort of physical fact that i was suppressing that, that i i genuinely uh, did need more sleep so you know okay i yeah that's that's reminded what you've said has reminded me of that that particular example Okay, thank you very much for your question. Anyone else? Population question? Well, I'll, I'm going. Hello, Jim. This is Ramsey here. I have, do have a question for you, um, which I'm just going to look at. I wrote just in my, I have a, hold on. I wrote it down so I make sure I remembered it. So that's, that's exactly what I did. Yeah. yeah. Now, Jim, I'm aware that you're a member of the Middle Way Society, and that the society yeah. does the B word, which is the Buddhism word. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to describe your practice to someone who knew nothing about what you do, would you describe it as a secular Dharma practice, a secular Buddhist practice, a Middle Way practice, or something completely different? What would you sell them? So uh th this is one of those things where um you know you can you can make it make sense to yourself but as, as soon as you realize that actually no i'm, I'm being this asked asked this question by someone else and i'm gonna have to make myself understood to other people you, you start running into um you know the problems of what do people understand this particular phrase to mean or that particular phrase to mean um in in the middle way society um the the guy who started who well who started it certainly who uh, sort of seems to have m most of the fresh ideas of it um it's called robert ellis um he's recently published a book which is i'm just going to wave it i don't know if it will there are. it's called the buddha's middle way there we go um at the end of it because he, he starts with this kind of question that, that ramsey's just asked um i will just say what he said he said um so uh, this is at the very end the end of the conclusion he said uh I mean, he, he spent a long time, um, I think it was about 20 years. So sort of from his, I think when he was at university in his late teens, um, about 20 years as part of a uh, sort of traditional but Western um, Buddhist movement. Um, and although he said he got, he got a lot from that, especially um, sort of the learning about uh, sort of meditation and how, you know, what that could possibly mean for his life. Um, he did grow a bit disillusioned with uh, sort of the, the more rigid uh, people who were or people in the organization being stuck in the, the very formal rigid beliefs and, and not looking at them in a, in a middle way way. Anyway, uh, what he says at, at the end of this book is um, I pers I will personally call myself a Buddhist, um, but only on occasions where the basis of what people consider to be Buddhism um, is a middle way Buddhism. So I think at, at the moment I'd agree with that. And I've, I mean, I've I've met with various people who have sort of more or less religious uh, sort of inclinations, and uh, I mean, you know, uh, beyond Buddhism as well. Um, certainly, uh, I look at Buddhism as, Buddhism as being an influence, but um, in, in terms of of what I do, it's it's certainly influenced by Buddhism, and I think that the thing that has come from or the the way that you can uh, look at the various things that the the, the Buddha's teachings. Um, it's the aspects of uh, the middle way that have, have come out uh, as being the, the things that are most sort of useful in terms of, uh, you know, an, eth an ethic, a, a way of living my life. Um, you've, you've no doubt heard quite a few things from uh, people like Winton Higgins and Stephen Batcher, and I find that sort of their approaches to, you know, whether they do or don't identify one way or the other, 
Um, certainly the approaches they take are, are, are very uh, middle way type approaches and, uh, and the ones that f for now I'm, I'm going to keep on with. But yeah, it's, it, it changes like, like, like I've been saying that, I mean, you know, it's a navigation. I, I'm, I'm not going to sort of commit myself to, to one thing because I know that I can't commit myself to one thing. You know, I'm, I'm 42 years old. You know, I know enough about how conditions in your life change and your perspective on things change. And um, you know, I'm, not gonna uh, plonk myself into one one particular uh, camp and say you know that's it that's the final word i know everything you know i know everything there is to need to know and i'm just going to shoehorn my experience into that particular framework so uh, I'm, you know, I'm still keeping an open mind about that thank you jim anybody else if you haven't i will just say thank you jim okay thanks jim thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jim. It seems like we've run out of questions, which is fine. We were uh, okay. Yeah, this thing's come to an end. <laughs> it's come to an end. This is. Uh, it's been a very interesting evening. Thank you. I hope you have a good day. Your day and is. You have a good evening. Okay, and um, we will we will be in touch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for See coming. you later. Thank you.